Right, um, I think we'll get on with the main event tonight and a little bit of history, a very short history. Almost 30 years ago, Rob and myself and our teenage daughter saved up our money really hard and we went on a safari to East Africa. For us at the time, a working couple with a teenager, everybody knows what that's like, and uh, it was a very expensive holiday and it was going to be the holiday of a lifetime. In fact, it was so much the holiday of a lifetime, we've been every two years ever since. Mm -hmm. apart from last year. Eventually, Steve and our friend Jeff, who's not here tonight, joined us. And not only was the wildlife beautiful, but so was the dark skies at night. So you can see what the attraction is. Steve is going to, is our representative to talk tonight about our trips to East Africa, our trips to see the beautiful wildlife, and the trips in search of wild astronomy. Steve. Thank you very much, Sue. So, wild astronomy. You can see the mantra in the top left there. Wildlife by day, stars by night, sleep when you get home. There is no point in wasting any time when you're out there. So, when we talk about wild astronomy, all of us here have an interest in astronomy, some of us also have an interest in photography, and of course they overlap. Some of you are interested in astrophotography. But also you might be interested in wildlife, and you might be interested in photography, and of course they overlap as well, where the wildlife could be animals, could be birds, whatever. But if you go on safari, that means you see a lot of wildlife, and because you're getting usually away from any light pollution, you're seeing the glorious night skies, a, because of the lack of light pollution, but B, because you're in a different part of the world. In the case of going to East Africa, you're on the equator, you can see the north and south southern hemispheres. So by wild astronomy, we asked ourselves, well, why not combine all three? And that's, in a sense, why we go on safari. So wild astronomy is wildlife and astronomy and photography, essentially our three interests that all overlap. So we're talking about going on safari. We're talking about where to go and what you would need to take with you. We're talking about lodges and camps where you might want to stay. Something about game drives, how you actually get out there and actually see the wildlife. How you capture all of this wonderful wildlife, not just the memories, but the photography. And of course, astrophotography. So you can see perhaps from that, astrophotography is not the main part of this talk. So be patient. So, going on safari. We're talking about going on safari to East Africa. There's Kenya and Tanzania. They're blown up a little bit. If you fly into Kenya, you end up there at Nairobi. If you're going to Tanzania, you end up there at Dar es Salaam. We have visited lots of national parks when we've been on safari, as Sue says, quite a few times in the last couple of decades or so. So, we visited quite a few national parks. We're not going to give you the details of all of that. That just gives you an idea of the sort of spread that we're talking about. What would you need to take with you? Well, probably sun cream, not a bad idea. It's quite sunny out there. You might want a hat. It's probably a good idea to take insect spray, and just in case the insect repellent doesn't work, you really need to take malaria tablets as well. That's just a precaution, but it's obviously a sensible precaution. You probably want to take a bird book or an animal book. There's examples here if you want to flick through the sort of things that we've used. Binoculars, you don't need huge binoculars, whether you're talking about wildlife or the night skies, 10 by 42s are enough. Anything larger, like 10 by 50, the binoculars are heavier and you wouldn't want to carry those around your neck all day. 10 by 42s are fantastic. You might have a bridge camera, you might have a DSLR camera. When we started going on safari, you would need to take, remember that? Remember film? Yes, 35 millimeter film. You could get a massive, 36, yes, 36 exposures on one roll of film, which means if you're going on a two-week safari, you really need to pack an extra bag full of film, and uh, it was not untypical to take maybe 20 rolls of film and still run out and having to buy stuff out there. These days, of course, you just get yourself a terabyte SD card, and you've got 100,000 images on one card. OK, I don't advise that. All your eggs in one basket is probably not a good idea. But it's a reminder how, how far we've come in 20 years from having to take film with you and hope your pictures come out 
versus digital, where you can see what you're doing as you go along. So what's your first view of Africa going to be? I'm sure you've all seen the programs. You've all seen David Attenborough. Of course, when you go to Africa, the first thing you see is vast open plains with wildebeest and cheetah and antelope all over the place. No, the first thing you see is Nairobi Airport uh, and the chaos that ensues on trying to work out where the hell you're supposed to be, having got off an eight or nine hour flight from the UK, trying to work out what goes on next. Hopefully, if things are organized, <clears throat> you get into a safari vehicle of some kind and you get whisked away probably a few hours out of Nairobi to your first destination, which hopefully is a glorious lodge where you can start to relax and take in the scenery, start looking at the animals and start looking at the vistas and the watering holes. In some cases, we see animals as soon as you leave the airport. It is possible to leave the airport and see zebra as soon as you've left. But generally speaking, you go into a national park before you actually start your holiday proper, as it were. You don't have to go by road. You can fly if you wish. It might take hours and hours and hours to drive, but it, the equivalent journey in an aircraft might only be half an hour or something. But consequentially, a lot more expensive. And you would perhaps fly to somewhere like Rufiji International Airport, somewhere like that. Um, the plane actually scares the animals off the stripway first by flying over it, gets rid of the elephants and the other things, and then it comes into land. And that is the entire apron, by the way. That's it. So let's have a look at some of the accommodation, some of the lodges and some of the camps that you might want to visit or stay at. This is us, uh, the four of us, uh, Sue, Rob, myself, Jeff, and our driver and guide and friend of many years now, David. We have gone back to him for many years because we know him, he knows us, and he gives us a good deal when it comes to setting up a safari. This is the view from one lodge. You can see it overlooks a lake. The Great Rift Valley runs through East Africa, and the Great Rift Valley has produced quite a few lakes. Therefore, there are quite a few lakes within Kenya and Tanzania. So there's no lack of life surrounded by the water. The rooms are not Spartan. We've given up on that. We're all of an age where we really do not want to rough it anymore. And so when we go on safari, we try and make sure it's not necessarily luxury, but it is definitely comfortable. A room, for instance, might have a veranda on which you can sit and do your bird watching. The rooms themselves are comfortable, well appointed, a comfortable bed, mosquito nets, if that's appropriate for the region you're in, and what you might call Western sanitation. In other words, everything you would expect in a, in a half-decent hotel will be available for you at these various lodges. Kenya is set up for tourists. It wants tourists, therefore it gives you what you want. All of these lodges are in national parks that have stunning views. That's why they are there. That's their raison d'etre to provide tourists with the best experience possible. So you have lodges with fantastic views over the Masai Mara Plains, for instance. Or one of our favorite lodges is a, is a little bit further to the southeast, but this particular lodge has its own watering hole. And if you wish, you don't need to go on game drives and go looking for the animals. If you wish, you can just stay put. Nine to five, if that's what you wanted to do, you could get, get up in the morning and just sit on that terrace and watch the wildlife come to the watering hole. If you want a sedentary, sedentary experience, that's, that's perfectly possible. Here's a very contented individual sitting on the terrace, <laughs> a pair of binoculars around his neck, camera on a tripod, bird book in hand, and somebody is bringing him coffee every few minutes. I mean, what, what could be better than that? Well, OK. <laughs> At some parts of the day, coffee is replaced with uh, a good old Tusker, yeah. uh, alcoholic drink. Yes. And there's Jeff, who can't be with us this evening, unfortunately. But again, sitting on that terrace is one of the nicest ways of passing an hour or a few hours or perhaps an entire day just watching the wildlife come and go. From that sort of distance, you get wonderful views of the wildlife. Here's a herd of eland that have come to the water to drink at sunrise and effectively you will see the animals come and go throughout the day. Some animals will drink and then walk away and then it's the turn of the next set of animals that come and have a drink and then walk away. And just watching the behavior of the animals can be fascinating. We're on the equator, so the sun rises at six and the sun sets at six. 12 hours day, 12 hours night. 
but if you wish, you can stay up in the evening and the watering holes are often floodlit, so you can continue watching the animals for essentially as long as you want to. If you want to stay up all night and watch the nocturnal visitors, that's fine as well. This was the first attempt at astrophotography. Back in 2003, I was using color slide film for all of the wildlife photography. I thought, whilst I'm here, I've only got a finite number of rolls of film, but it's probably worth trying to see what I get of the night sky. So this is a short exposure. This is slide film, so there's no EXIF information in the digital image, so I can't actually remember what the exposure was. Some of you might recognize the constellation of Scorpius here, the sting in the tail, the S of Scorpius, Antares, the teapot for those who know their asterisms, and a little bit of steam coming out of the teapot is the Milky Way. But notice that the Milky Way doesn't show up particularly clearly. It's not a very long exposure. This is just a camera on a tripod, and therefore the exposures have to be kept short, otherwise the stars trail quite badly. So they're already trailed a little bit, but we can't see much. So I thought, well, OK, we can see Scorpius, which we can't really see very well from the UK. But apart from that, it's not a great picture. And that was taken at the lodge we've just shown you. A lot of lodges have a character all to themselves. Some lodges like this one happen to be on stilts. You get a great view over the plains if you want to sit in your room and watch the animals. Or if you wanted to sit in the restaurant, again, they have a similar view over the plains. Not only do the lodges have a character all of their own, quite often the view is characteristic. So in this particular case, the lodge is sitting on the edge of a caldera overlooking a huge crater, which is an ecosystem all of its own. When you visit this lodge, not only do you get a great view, but if you wish, you can drive down into the crater and explore the ecosystem that exists within the crater rim, within the crater walls. If you think Africa is all dusty plains and very little else, no, there are some regions which are very lush. The water table isn't necessarily a long way below ground, and if you access the water table, you can make sure that all of the vegetation in the area can grow, such as here, Jeff um, undergoing a, a bird walk in the grounds of a lodge in the Masai Mara. This is one of our favorite lodges for a lot of different reasons, regions, <coughs> a lot of different reasons. This is Altakai Lodge in Amboseli National Park. There's Rob. I think Rob, yes, there's Rob, sitting outside one of the lodge rooms. It's a very nice area of the country, lots of wildlife to see within a short distance, just a, a short drive away. Plus, it has beautiful grounds where you can, if you wish, just amble around and go on bird walks. Again, in between the, the meals that are provided, you can just either stay put and snooze, or you can go on walks and have expert bird watchers guide you through the, uh, the species of birds that you're seeing. In a slightly different angle, you see that there's perhaps a prevailing wind. Perhaps you can just about make that out in this particular case. There is, there is a little bit of a breeze. It's sometimes uh, produced a little bit of a problem with astrophotography. But if you look to the right of this picture, the trees thin out a bit. And we have found that this particular lodge is wonderful for astrophotography. Partly because it's a nice area, and if you go to the right place, you can get away from the trees, and then the sky opens up to you. The other reason it's great for astrophotography is, as this intrepid explore, explorer will tell you here, OK, he's probably pointing at the elephants, but perhaps you can see the thin wires here. There is an electric fence all the way around the lodge. It's not, a, it's not a big metal fence for stopping animals running into. It just gives them enough of a jolt to persuade them not to come any further. So elephants do not come into the lodge. Zebras do not come into the lodge, which means it's safe to do astrophotography at night. You can be out in the middle of nowhere with sort of just a few trees around you, an enormous expanse of really dark sky, and you might hear some animals in the distance, but you know from the electric fence that you're safe and it's OK to do astrophotography. So this particular lodge in Amboseli National Park has become our favorite place to do astrophotography. And it's got to the point when we, we plan a safari, we try and work out, can we be in this lodge close to new moon? So that gives us the maximum chance of getting some good astrophotography done. And we effectively plan our holiday around the phases of the moon. I'm not sure many other people do that, with the exception of eclipse chasers, I guess. Uh, this is, again, an attempt from 2003. 
Here's a picture from Rob on the right with colour print film and me on the left, colour slide film. So we're still pre-digital and we were just giving it a go, thinking what can we do in terms of pointing at the sky. Uh, the exposure is relatively short on the right-hand side here. I've taken a rather longer exposure in the hope of seeing more, but of course, although that makes the Milky Way a little bit brighter, it also means the Milky Way has blurred because of the motion of the Earth producing the star trails. So again, it indicated to us the potential of astrophotography. Unfortunately, all we can really do is star trails unless we could take really short exposures, which really don't work with slide film and print film. You just can't get enough light on the film in just 10 or 20 seconds of exposure. You need to be rather longer. But it gave us the hint of things to come. Not all of the places you might want to stay are lodges. Some of them are tented camps. If you like the idea of spending a few nights under canvas, perfectly safe as long as you don't leave your tent, but under canvas you get a real experience of being in the bush. This is so-called governor's camp. For those of you who saw things like Big Cat Diary, this is where it was filmed, in this particular region of the Masai Mara in the, south, uh, the southwest of uh, Kenya. Now that looks perhaps a little bit idyllic. You all have a tent close to the Mara River and there's clearly some space there away from the trees. Wouldn't that be a great place to do astrophotography? Well, it would be, except for the fact that the second morning I was there, I stepped out of my tent and realized that there had been a nocturnal visitor. This particular camp and many others do not have electric fences, which means during the night, lions, elephants, any animal that wants to, comes a visiting. And I do not ever intend to do astrophotography with one of these things next to me. I got quite scared when I was in a position to do some astrophotography, and I think I was safe, but I did hear a lion roaring. And I thought, what if they decided to switch off the electric fence tonight? So actually, we do prefer to go places we know are safe. In that sense, we do not take chances. And that was pointed out to me that, yes, that was a lioness who visited and must have walked right outside my tent that particular night. This is just what it's like at Governor's Camp, uh, a wonderfully relaxed breakfast out in, the, out in the fresh air there. Another tented camp, this time south of the border in Tanzania, so-called Rufiji River Camp, sitting on the mighty Rufiji River, a little bit um, southwest of Dar es Salaam. And this happened to be a place, again, where a dabble at astrophotography was possible. This is now 2007. Now I've started to dabble with digital photography. Correction, this is 2005 because it's Tanzania. Thank you. It's 2005 because this is Tanzania. And this is my first venture into digital photography. So I now have a digital SLR and a wide angle lens. So I thought this is more sensitive. So will I see more? Well, in general, yes. Compared to the pictures we saw earlier, we can see a little more detail with relatively short exposures. In this case, I still had to go to about two minutes to get enough light through this particular zoom lens rather than a prime lens. And I tried a few different things. And yes, you can see the vista of the Milky Way over the trees there. The trees aren't illuminated quite as brightly as you would see there. Most of this is just scattered light from some path lights that make sure you know where your footing is when you're walking through the tented camp. A little bit of that light is reflected, so it's not quite as bright as those trees perhaps would make it look. But you can start to see lovely structure within the Milky Way. And in one particular image, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Milky Way from the UK, but not so familiar with the Milky Way looking a little further south, this is a, a little bit further south than you normally go. So those, that pair of stars is Alpha and Beta Centauri. And if you go a little bit further along, that little dark patch there is the Colsac Nebula sitting in the Southern Cross. But because we're talking 120 second exposures, and because this is my first foray into digital photography, I thought, well, given that I'm on a static tripod and the stars are moving, is it possible instead to take a series of 20-second exposures and stack them together? Which is now, of course, very common practice, but this was new to me back in the mid-noughties. This is some 15, 16 years ago. 
So yes, you can stop the stars trailing by taking shorter exposures and stacking them together, but it doesn't exactly produce a wonderful image of the Milky Way. So it still has its limitations. There's a limitation to what you can do if you're on a static tripod. This convinced me that we absolutely needed to change to the idea of using star trackers of some kind or another. And at that particular point, I said, I am going to build myself a star tracker, which we'll see shortly. So that was just going back to the original uh, two-minute exposure. So let's move on from astrophotography, and we'll return to that at the end. But let's just have a think about how you go and find the animals. If you wish, you can just stay in the lodge and watch the animals come to you. But generally speaking, game drives are usually offered to anybody on safari. And typically, it will be going out for a drive, maybe a couple of hours or so, after sunrise, and perhaps a couple of hours before sunset. Generally, you don't go out in the dark. You let the animals do their thing at night. But just after sunrise, just before sunset, the light is really good. That's the best time to catch the animals. So quite often, you get up in the dark. Again, sunrise somewhere around 6 o'clock. So you might get up at 5 o'clock or thereabouts. Um, decent tent, uh, decent uh, tented camps and lodges will bring you cocoa in the morning to keep you uh, fed and watered because you don't usually have breakfast until you get back from your game drive. So there's the four of us again with, a, with our driver and guide and friend David of many years now. And that's a fairly typical vehicle that we might use. It's a converted safari van where they've converted it such that you now have this sunroof that lifts up. And that means everybody is kept in shade, but everybody gets a very nice view. You can stand if you wish or stay seated if you wish. And here you can see that we end up with pan and tilt heads, which are either on monopods or I prefer to clamp mine to the side of the safari bus roof. And then you have a very stable place to, to hold your camera whilst you're taking your pictures. It is not uncommon to have people standing up looking in different directions such that as you go along, you catch any animals that might be there. Some of the animals are in your face obvious. Some of the animals might be hiding in bushes. And it's good to have lots of pairs of eyes looking in different directions so you catch everything that's out there. It is important to be color coordinated with your t-shirts. So make sure you talk to your friends uh, before you go out in the morning. And when you're in the bush, sometimes you are actually in the bush. So just beware of the foliage. So do you need to have a very long telephoto lens? If you want to go out there and photograph lions and cheetah and birds, do you need a whopping great telephoto lens? Is that the sort of thing you actually need? I'm impressed by that guy's biceps, if nothing else, in holding a lens like that. We have seen people in other safari vehicles who do have super long telephoto lenses, especially those people who want to photograph a bird that's half a mile away. But that's not quite how we work it. Over the years, I have found that a 300 millimeter lens is all you need. For those who know your photographic lenses, the uh, a 300 millimeter lens on a, uh, on a camera will be either 300 millimeter or perhaps 450 millimeter equivalent. If you've got a bridge lens with an equivalent focal length, that will be fine. You do not need something that's longer than your arm in order to get good safari images of animals. And that's the one that I found suits me best. I didn't know about this lens until fairly recently, and I used it on the last safari. Absolutely fantastic. So if you wanted to get a picture of a lion like that, how close would you have to get in order to get a picture like that? Well, as it happens, Sue took a picture of me looking at the lion, and that tells you how far away the lion was. If the animals are comfortable, they will not run away. There's no reason for a lion to run away, because if we got any closer, he would tell us what's going on, and he would win. So a lion is not scared of a safari bus. It's not a threat. It's not a female. Therefore, there's no particular reason. It's not edible. It's not a female. It's not a threat. So lions and other animals will not necessarily run away. And that tells you here, with a sleeping or dozing lion, you can get to within 10 meters of them, and you're not har harassing them, and they are quite comfortable. For instance, here we see we were driving along a particular dirt track. And we just happened to notice there was a leopard sitting a few meters ahead. As it happens, our driver didn't notice that. And we were all shouting, look, 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 there's a leopard down there. It was about 10 meters away. 
and it was not particularly phased by our presence because, again, it did not see us as a threat. We ambled a little bit closer and it got bored and walked away, back into the bush. The rule in Kenya is you can't follow animals. You stick to the dirt tracks. If an animal doesn't like you, it walks off into the bush and you lose it. And that's just the rule. You can't go harassing them. You can't go chasing them. And if you've got a good driver and guide, the driver guide will not say, let's go after that leopard. Let's run up to him and see if we can get closer. A good driver or guide will say, I know how leopards behave. He's thirsty. She's thirsty. Whatever. There's a watering hole over there. If we go over here and wait for five minutes, that leopard will walk right in front of us. And that sort of thing has happened. And we've been in the right place at the right time. And the leopard, again, pretty much ignores us. It just wants a drink of water or whatever. And the fact that it has to walk past us barely five meters away is no hassle for the leopard. As long as humans don't interfere with animal behavior, then animals behave the way they would anyway. And so you get beautiful close-up images of animals like that beautiful leopard. We go out on game drives perhaps at 4 o'clock for a couple of hours before sunset. And once we're done, because we're digital photography now, what we do is sit down and look at each other's images on the back of the camera. We do a little bit of chimping. You know what chimping is? Yeah? Looking at the back of the camera saying, ooh, 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 ah! <laughs> um, so you couldn't do that with film. You just hoped. Did you get a picture of that? Oh, might have done. Was it in focus? No idea. I'll find out in three weeks when they come back from Boots. Now, with digital photography, you can say, ah, my picture's better than your picture, or whatever. And so there's a little bit of that that goes on at the end of a game drive. So let's have a think about wildlife photography. And this is just a blind, let us show you some of our favorite images. That's the, that's the next few minutes, is just look at some of the images we've taken. This is just to give you an idea of what some savannas actually look like. You probably can't see what's going on there, so let me blow up the middle part of that. Perhaps you now realize that what we're looking at is about a million wildebeest and a few zebra. And that's not an exaggeration. At this particular time of year, approximately one and a half million wildebeest move out of Tanzania into Kenya through the region that we were visiting. And if you go at the right time of year, because the Wildebeest are following the grass, and the grass follows the rain. It's all relatively predictable as to where the animals will be. And if you've got a mil million wildebeest, you've probably got a few lions in there as well. So this is a reminder that sometimes you don't need to go find the animals. You just take a step out of your lodge or just literally take a few steps into a national park. Usually you stay inside the safari van, but basically you will find yourself amid animals. It is not a question of there's no animals within a mile radius of where we are. Generally speaking, they're out there. Same for birds. Sometimes you can find yourself amongst a huge number of flamingo. In this particular case, we walked up to a lake and were rather surprised to find suddenly a thousand pelicans took off and then flocked around us. And that's a small number of the pelicans that were in uh, the sky at the time. I didn't have a wide enough angle lens to get them all in. So the animals are there sometimes in absolutely huge numbers. And often, animals are curious about us. It is possible that young animals might not have seen a safari van before. In the case of the giraffe, I got the distinct impression that that youngster didn't know what we were, and the mother sort of understood what was going on but wasn't either encouraging or discouraging the youngster to get any closer to us or any further. It's just clear that they were both curious as to what we were up to. As long as we don't disturb them, as long as we don't make too much noise, then they're happy to coexist with us. And in the case of zebras, again, zebras will run away from a lion, but they won't run away from a safari vehicle because a safari vehicle has never done them any harm, so why would they run away from it? Here was an interesting bit of animal behavior because a lioness had a few cubs, and you know that mothers are very protective about their cubs. The cubs are in the long grass where you can't see them because the long grass is twice as high as a cub. But we realized that was going on, and then the mother came and sat on this log in between us and the cubs. 
And it was absolutely clear that she was in charge. She was going to put up with us sitting there taking pictures of her and anything else we can see. And she was in command. She looked over her shoulder to make sure we were behaving ourselves. And once her cubs had moved out of the grass, she got down from the log and then moved away. It was absolutely clear she knew what was going on. She knew we were a potential threat to her cubs, but she just sat on that log to make absolutely clear we could not do them any harm. And then she moved away. But for a minute or two, we got this wonderful view of the lioness sitting there right in front of us. Sometimes the grass is quite long. Not only can it hide cubs, it can hide baby elephants as well. Depending on the time of year, depending on where you go, some areas are quite arid, but others can be quite lush and sometimes quite swampy, depending on exactly where the water table is and how much rain or how much snow has melted on the top of Kilimanjaro and come down into the plains. So sometimes it's lush enough to hide an elephant. Sometimes the grass is actually high enough to hide a giraffe. Okay, the, graf the giraffe is probably sitting down, but no, no, no. I'm sure the giraffe is standing up in that particular picture there. But of course, it would be tough if the grass was always so high that you couldn't possibly see animals smaller than an elephant, for instance. But that is exceptional. Most of the time, the grass is fairly short, not least because it's been grazed by other animals. So a lot of the time, the grass is the sort of length you would expect it to be, and so you get views like this. This is one of my favorite pictures, simply because it just reminds me how peaceful it can be. It's just a few zebras doing what zebras do. Nothing much except eating grass. That's what they do. OK, there's always at least one zebra keeping an eye out for lions. But the rest of the family is just getting on with eating. I can relate to that, absolutely. And this, this was taken not long after sunrise. And again, I just think it's a wonderful, peaceful view of how animals exist. Let's have a look at a few birds. There are something like, in Kenya, a thousand species of bird. And as far as I can tell, Sue and Rob have seen about half of those thousand species. They keep a record if you want to come and have a look at what they've done. So, so far, they've got about 450 species under their belt. In other words, they need to go on safari more often to get even more of that fraction, to get it above half and start pushing towards that thousand. We have rather dull-looking starlings in the UK. In Kenya, they have beautiful starlings, some of which have iridescent feathers. Quite a lot of them are very colorful. Just look at the beautiful golden-breasted starling on the right there. This is another reminder that when you've got animals at the right distance, if you open up the aperture of the lens, you throw the background out of focus, and then you get these wonderful images of sharp birds on a blurred background, so they stand out really beautifully. A few more starlings. Again, a lot of them are iridescent, so you get beautiful colors when you catch them in the sunshine. There are far more species than I can possibly go through. As I say, uh, Rob and Sue between them have got pictures of probably 400 to 450 species. Here's just a handful of some of the birds that have been photographed in the last few safaris. Some of them you might recognize as similar to their English counterparts. Others are very, very different. Some are very cooperative. Here, the bee eaters knew we wanted to take a picture, and so they lined up. OK, <laughs> some of them are pointing the wrong way. It's, it's like herding cats sometimes. But they are generally cooperative, and you can get a beautiful picture like that. The lilac-breasted roller, beautiful colors, lilac and blue, etc., is the national bird of Kenya. And we like photographing it, not because it's the national bird of Kenya, but because, A, it's got very nice colors, especially in the sunshine. But also, its flight feathers, when it flies, are absolutely beautiful. So we've spent some of our time creeping up on a bird on a branch, waiting for it to fly, and then <coughs> coughing and waiting for it to fly, and then, if necessary, slamming a door and waiting for it to fly. Do they fly on demand? Do they? Hell, no. You have to wait a while, and sometimes we have to go away, and as soon as we turn our back, off it goes. But when you do catch it right, you get beautiful electric blue flight feathers on the underside and overside of its wings, and trying to catch it in flight is one of the things we try and do, because it's such a beautiful bird. 
There are bigger birds. You almost certainly recognize some of these. I'm sure you recognize the ostrich in the top left, the common ostrich, and herons in the bo bottom right. But there's also brown hornbills and storks and egrets and other large birds like that. Some of the large birds are rather odd looking, like the hammer cop, which looks like something really weird. Uh, Cory bustards, which are large and rather weird birds. And even more bizarre, the secretary birds that go around stamping in the grass uh, trying to kill snakes. There are plenty of raptors. If you're interested in eagles and hawks and falcons, etc., there are I don't know how many species in East Africa. So there's an auger buzzard in the main part of the image and a, a lapic faced vulture in the inset there. It's not just a question of you only ever see vultures when they're diving down onto a kill and trying to devour a carcass. Sometimes you see them everywhere in trees and, uh, of course, uh, wheeling around in the sky as well. I'm not going to list all of the raptors we've seen. Again, we've seen huge eagles. We've seen little kestrel-like birds. One of the advantages of digital photography is you can take a picture of a bird even though it's quite a long way away, and if you've got a reasonable number of megapixels in your camera, you can then crop the image down and zoom in on part of that image so you don't have to be right next door to a bird to take a picture of it, which is just as well because some birds are more than 10 meters away. They might be 20 or 30 meters away. But with digital photography, you probably couldn't get away with this with slide and color film. There would just be too much grain. But with digital photography, with a sharp lens, if it's in focus, you can blow it up and get some superb images, even though the birds are quite distant. Some raptors will be flying. Some raptors will just be sitting in a tree. Again, you might simply say to yourself, well, it'd be nice to catch that one in flight. What do we do? Well, we're not going to be able to scare it away. It's a little bit too far away to make any noise. But let's just be patient. Let's not be in a hurry to go anywhere. Where else are we going to go? There might be other animals over there, but why don't we just stop and enjoy this sight and wait for this bird to fly? And after a few minutes, you may re be rewarded with, yes, the bird is about to take off, and then you get a wonderful picture of it launching and flying away. But the thing to remember is, don't be in too much of a hurry. If you're on safari to enjoy the wildlife, don't just tick it off as, yep, seen that bird, next. What are we going to? Take time. Take time and smell the roses, as it were. Now, in this particular case, we saw this bird. Can you tell why its head has exploded? <laughs> it was a little bit odd, until we realized that it was simply looking the wrong way. Um, birds are capable of turning their heads 180 degrees, especially raptors. And in this particular case, it just ruffled the feathers. So it gave this rather odd view of the bird. But if we waited long enough, then it turned round, and then we got a bit better view of it. I say that, but we're still not absolutely sure what bird that is. It's a juvenile, and so we're not absolutely sure of the, uh, of the identification of this particular raptor. We're often not far away from water. Again, remember, there are plenty of lakes. There are lots of rivers, like the Mara River. There are lots of lakes because we're in the Great Rift Valley, which has rifted and produced lots of pockets of water. So we're never too far from water, and that means there's lots of water birds. Perhaps in the bottom left, you can't really see what that is. It's a bed of lilies, and so perhaps not surprisingly, what's in the middle is a lily trotter or an African jacana. And if we blow it up, you see it's a beautiful bird with beautiful colors. Again, the advantage of digital photography is even if you take a relatively wide-angle lens and you've got a bird and 99% of background, you can still crop it and zoom in and get a very nice picture of the bird. Whenever you've got water, Remember, there are soda lakes as well as fresh lakes. You will get lots of flamingos. Depending on the time of year, depending on where the flamingos have decided to go, they do uh, move around between different lakes from time to time. But sometimes you can go to a lake and you can see half a million flamingo. Other times you go to a lake and there's just a few hundred or a few thousand. But it's really nice if you can catch one in flight. Again, if you catch it in focus, if you follow the bird, if you get the background out of focus, you get a wonderful image like this that Rob took last time, where you get a wonderful portrait of the bird in flight. 
if you like painting with light and you're talking about birds close to the water, no lack of opportunities of getting beautiful reflections of one kind or another, either static reflections or blurred reflections. It all gives you wonderful opportunities to get some really nice photos. And that applies not only to water birds, it applies to any animals that happen to be close to water. An elephant with its reflection is a rather odd thing to see, but yes, you get elephants walking around in the water, an impala jumping there with its reflection at the bottom, and a rather nice uh, picture of a, a zebra contemplating its own navel or something. It just seems to be sitting there. The rest of the herd was somewhere close by, but that zebra just decided to stand in the water and stare into the distance with a thousand-yard stare. Whenever you're around water, yes, there's plenty of wildlife, there's plenty of wa uh, water birds, but whenever you're around uh, a freshwater lake, there will be lots of animals that like to live not too far away from the lake. So you get animals such as these. There's plenty of rhinos around Lake Nakuru, north of Nairobi, and an, a, a zebra having a dust bath there. Animal, beha animal behavior is always interesting. And occasionally you catch, for instance, lions play fighting. Lions tend to hunt at night, so during the day they've got nothing much to do other than sleep and play, which is great for photographers because, again, they're either asleep under a tree and they don't mind you getting close to photograph them, or they're just playing like these youngsters, play fighting. Occasionally, of course, you see animals fighting for real, whether it's fighting for supremacy in terms of uh, the right to mate with the females, whether they're fighting over territory or whether they're fighting over food. In the bottom right, hyenas and lions having a bit of a scrap over who gets the kill of that particular wildebeest. So generally speaking, they fight with each other. But every once in a while, they want to have a pop at us as well. So this was an elephant that didn't like us getting particularly close. And rather than the elephant run away, he made it very clear who was in charge. He gave us the charge, and wham, uh, we had to get out of there. Our driver put his foot down, and uh, this elephant ran after us for a hair-raising few seconds until we realized we were outpacing it. But there was a little bit of time when the elephant seemed to be getting rather close to the safari vehicle. But he did eventually give up. Part of wildlife photography is serendipity. It's literally just being lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time. You can't always plan for that. In this particular case, there was a crowned crane, a beautiful bird, sitting on top, standing on top of a tree. And the idea was, that might make a nice photo. Let's line up for the photo. Just before taking the picture, what happens? The, the mate comes in from behind and lands on the same tree. The wings are outspread, and so you get a beautiful view of the second bird landing on the same place the first bird was positioned. But at the time, we only saw the first bird, and the second bird arriving was just pure luck. There have been times when we've been driving along. In this particular case, uh, we didn't see anything in particular, and Jeff said, what's that in the tree? And we said, what tree and what do you think you've seen? And he says, there might be, there's something in there. There might be a kill. Maybe there's an antelope there left from a leopard. When we got closer, we realized it was a lion asleep in the tree. And it just happened to be there just because it wanted some rest and it wanted some shade. And when we got closer, we got a nice picture of a lion in a tree. We were heading back to a lodge one day, and the sun was going. It was almost sunset, so the exposures on the camera were getting longer and longer and longer. But then suddenly, two cheetah came alongside the van. We think they were just playing with each other, um, possibly a couple of young brothers who were just having a race or something like that. But they came to within a few meters of the van and just outpaced us, running at 30 or 40 or 50 miles an hour. So I grabbed the camera and type, tried to take a picture, but the exposure was ridiculously long, like a quarter of a second or something. There was no way I could freeze the cheetah. But what you end up with is a very nice image, which gives you a sense of the pace at which cheetahs can move if they want to. But again, pure luck, we weren't trying to find these cheetah. They just happened to run alongside our road vehicle for a little while. This particular lion yawning, it wasn't until we got back and looked at the pictures that Sue realized that this picture that she had taken, a very nice bit of drool is coming off the lion's uh, jaw there. As it's, uh, yes, that's not a very thin tooth. That's just a lion um, yawning and having a little bit of drool in the morning, which we all have now and again, don't we? 
one place we visit, I've mentioned this before, Alta Kai in Amboseli National Park. Virtually every time we'd been until 1919, this was completely dry. But on this particular visit in 2019, lo and behold, instead of the entire area being bone dry, what do we find? A lake where there didn't used to be one. For some reason, the water level had risen. Whether it was a geological event or whether it's more water coming down from Kilimanjaro, not too sure, but we were told that a lake simply appeared there over a time period of a, a, a few weeks or something. Zebra like to go from A to B along particular paths. Just because there's a lake there doesn't mean the zebra will stop moving from A to B along exactly the same path. So they are doing what they always do to get from one place to another. The fact that their feet are getting wet is neither here nor there. You can see it's shallow. It's only a foot deep or so. So there's flamingo in the background doing their stuff, and then the zebra for, I don't know, for the best part of an hour, I think, these zebra were just marching in front of us, sloshing away as they were getting from one point to another. And it was just a spectacle that we were simply not expecting to see at the time. And again, that's now become one of my favorite photos and reminders of the African experience. So are you all bored yet? Any more yawns in the audience? No? OK, there's a few on the screen for you. So let's remind ourselves that when the day is done, we can't photograph any more animals. We don't agree with the idea of harassing them during the night when they're supposed to be doing their hunting and other things. So we leave them alone at night. But of course, that means either you go to bed for 12 hours or you have the ability to say, well, let's do some astrophotography then. So let's return to one of the main aims of this particular talk, as well as telling you about the safari experience let us tell you about how we did some astrophotography. So I said a few slides ago that we'd come to the conclusion that if you put a camera on a tripod, you will get some movement of the stars. They will either be very short trails, but then you won't see much, or if you want longer exposures, your stars will trail and you won't get any detail, for instance, in the Milky Way because it will all blur out. So you need a star tracker. So I decided to build myself one so between something like 2007 and 2013, I used this do-it-yourself star tracker. This is a star tracker I built myself. You can build one for about 20 quid or something. It runs off a couple of AA batteries, and there's a motor here to turn the, motor, uh, turn the camera such that it turns in one revolution in one day and hence tracks the sky, the sky as long as you point it in the right direction. So for quite a few years, I used my do-it-yourself tracker. It looked very odd on airport x-rays, and I had one or two incidences where they asked me to open my bag because they didn't know what the hell that thing was. But after a little while, um, Jeff and Rob and myself decided that we would go commercial and actually buy a star tracker, which has some advantages over doing it yourself. So that star tracker is an Ioptron sky tracker. Other trackers are available. Let, let me just make that clear that that's just one of many. That just happened to be the best value at the time we bought them back in 2013. It can take a camera with a wide-angle lens, such as the one that is actually demonstrated here on Rob's right-hand side. Uh, and it can also take a, a somewhat longer telephoto lens here. It's being used with my camera and a 300 millimeter telephoto lens. So the tracker is fairly small. Um, but it can take quite a few kilograms of camera and lens. In, what is a tracker? A tracker is just a motor in a box, basically. So the only reason you're paying money is for the precision at which it turns, the speed at which it turns, has to be one revolution in 23 hours, 56 minutes to match the rotation of the Earth. And you have to somehow be able to line it up to make sure the rotation axis of the tracker is the same as the rotation axis of the Earth. <coughs> So that's why it comes with a little polar scope, as many of you will be familiar with equatorial mounts, for instance. In this case, the camera mounts on here on the tripod bush, and the polar scope is off to one side. When you look through the polar scope, you see a red reticle like this. And in order to work out where do I have to point this, an app on your phone, your iPhone or your Android or whatever, an app will tell you, because the app knows where you are in the world, and what time it is from the GPS signal, it knows exactly where Polaris ought to be if you're pointing at the North Celestial Pole. 
So in this particular case, for this particular latitude, longitude, time and date, etc., it says that Polaris ought to be a little star just at that position if that is the correct north celestial pole. So you simply look through the polar scope and then just adjust your tripod as necessary to make sure Polaris is in the right place. Then you know your tracker is lined up and the tracker motor will then turn at one revolution in 23 hours 56 minutes, which means, Bob's your uncle, you've now got a star tracker, which means no more star trails. So that's dead easy to do if you can see Polaris. But that's fine from the UK, but in Kenya, we're on the equator. So the North Celestial Pole, of course, is directly above the Earth's <coughs> North Pole. From the UK, from latitudes of 50-odd degrees, Polaris is high on the sky, easy to see, no problem lining up. But if you're on the equator, then Polaris and the North Celestial Pole are going to be hidden behind things on the horizon, like hills and elephants and other things. They are going to block your view of Polaris. So you can't line up on Polaris. So the question is, if we've got a tracker, that's a great idea, but how are we going to line it up? Well, there are alternative ways of lining up. You need to find north, and you can do that with a compass, but bear in mind that true north and magnetic north are two different things. And bear in mind that compasses can be affected by metal objects and magnets. For instance, star trackers. So that's not a good idea to put a compass on top of a star tracker and hope it tells you which way is north. So you can at least get the elevation right because the elevation of the north celestial pole should be the same as your latitude. So as long as you know where you are, you can get the elevation correctly. But working out which way is north is a little bit more problematic because compasses are generally not very reliable. Last year, I tried this method of looking up in advance where stars will be using an app, whether it be Sky Safari or Stellarium or whatever your favorite app is. You can say, on this particular date, I'm going to be taking astrophotographs. Where are the stars, for instance, in the plow go going to be? At what time of night is that particular star going to be north? And at what time of night is that star going to be north? And at what time of night is that star going to be north? And then you go out into the night, you say, OK, I know that star is going to be due north at 9 o'clock. I just have to wait a few minutes, and then I know that way is north because I can see that star in the plow or something you can easily recognize. So at least you can then line up and say, I know that's north. If I wait until that particular time, just make yourself a table of when these stars are going to be due north and then use that as a reference lookup, if you like, on the particular day you want to do your astrophotos. Not Perfect, not as easy as lining up on Polaris, but if you can't see Polaris, these are alternative ways of doing it. There's now a few Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. I've included this image uh, really just to show you what the night sky is like at Ambazelli. We've already seen the static uh, film images earlier on. This now is um, last year, sorry, 2019, uh, taken with a digital camera. You can see, as before, the trees are lit to a certain degree, but again, this is actually very low level lighting, and the brightness in the trees is exaggerated to some degree by the 20 second exposure. But what it does show us is that the sky itself is very dark, the brighter stars are standing out, and I don't know whether you can see at the back, the Milky Way is starting to pop out, and you can, can from here certainly see some of the dark lanes as well. And that's a single 20 second image on a tracker with this gear. Uh, next uh, slide, please, Steve. Um, I've included this image for two reasons. The first is that uh, it's not a bad image. Um, it was the first night at Mazzelli um, in. Uh, in 2019, as the uh, observant amongst you will see, it's taken this F22. Now, the photographers, the astrophotographers amongst you will say, well, that is wrong. Why on earth are you taking an image at F22? Yeah, I asked myself that one. I bought a new camera and a new lens. Uh, Nikon 50mm F1.8 D type lens. 
to be honest, I don't know what exactly what I did wrong. I know what to do to fix it now. I mean, fortunately, I found out the following day. But I ended up taking all of the first night's images at f22. That is oh so wrong. Lesson learnt, though. Understand your equipment before you go on holiday, not when you get there. The second reason is that although it's at f22, it does show rather a lot of detail. We've got a lot of bright areas in the Milky Way. You can see some of the dark areas as well. And it just goes to show how good the skies are in a dark sky in East Africa. Uh, next image, please. This is what I was really after. This is a, a mosaic of around about 15 images. I actually took more, but because I didn't get the overlaps right, I got too much overlap, some of the images weren't used in the stacking because they were those areas were already covered by the other images. So there's about 15 in there. It covers a huge chunk of sky. And the previous image, which was just a, a single frame, as it were, is roughly in the middle, um, that, that sort of area there. Despite the fact that it's a far shorter image, because it's at f2, I've actually caught more light with that image. Um, Steve will probably tell you, if you're interested later on, just how much more. But I've got a lot more data. And you can see the bright areas of the Milky Way. You can see all the dark things. You can see Jupiter and Saturn, the dark lazy you know, fuchsias at the top. Downside of catching lots and lots of light is that there are things there that we would normally recognise and say, oh, yeah, that's Scorpius. Well, yes, it's there somewhere. You can kind of see the top end of it, but goodness knows where the bottom end is. <laughs> Likewise with the teapot. It's there somewhere. There's that many stars. These familiar shapes and objects have disappeared. There are, there's lots more things in there that, could, that we could point out, especially if you look at the original image, which obviously is huge, and this has been shrunk down a little bit to get it onto screen. I'm not going to go through them all, because Steve has a similar image that he'll be showing later. It's not as good as mine is, of course, but, you know. We'll, we'll let him have the highlights of showing some of the other details that are actually available within the images. Back to you, Steve. Thank you, Rob. OK, so a number of different images of the Milky Way taken with either a standard or a wide-angle lens to cover a huge bit of sky. Over the years, I've never been sure what is the best lens to use, wide-angle or standard or a little bit longer focal length. One year, I tried an 85mm lens. The large and small Magellanic clouds, for those that don't know them, are quite close to the South Pole, which, given that we're on the equator, so the North Pole is on one horizon and the South Pole is on the other horizon, if the large and small Magellanic clouds are quite close to the South Pole, they're never very high off the horizon. So this was quite low in the sky, but I thought I'd give it a crack. In this case, with an 85mm lens, I tried, in this case, uh, a few images of one minute and then stacked those together to try and get the structure within the large Magellanic cloud. And the Tarantula Nebula shows up reasonably well. There wasn't much colour in this image, so this is just a black and white version of the image I took at the time. But just like Rob, I've tried to take images of the Milky Way. And again, this is a mosaic. This one is a little bit further along, in other words, further south than the region that Rob was showing just a moment ago. And again, it's a region of the Milky Way that we never see from the UK, rather than the area Rob just showed, which is sort of overlapping a little bit with the regions that we can see from the UK. This is further south. So for instance, this is Alpha and Beta Centauri, again, much further than we can see here. Now we have the Southern Cross showing quite clearly, the jewel box cluster showing just off the Southern Cross, and the large coal sack dark nebula off to one side. And way over on the right-hand side of the diagram, there is Eta Carina. One day, I might try and take a more detailed image of Eta Carina. It's a very interesting nebula. It's a star that's very unstable, and maybe Eta Carina one day will go supernova, much like it's been hypothesized that Betelgeuse will do, that we will see more easily from the UK. But it's uh, an unstable star and a huge 
Nebula. You may have seen some of the Hubble Space Telescope images of Eta Carina along the way. So again, a mosaic of quite a few individual images, in this particular case, 35 millimeter lens, so a relatively wide angle and quite a few of them stacked together to give this view of Centaurus and Crux and Carina. But just to give you a sort of flavor, if you like, if nothing else, of what it's like to see the Milky Way, we think from the UK, if you can get to a dark sky site, if you can get away from pollution, you get a reasonable view of the Milky Way. But this is, is, if you like, a representation of what you might see of the Milky Way if you're fully dark adapted in the UK. But to give you an idea of what it's like if you're in Africa, that's more like what you see. And you can't see color, but you can genuinely see a huge amount of structural detail within the Milky Way just by stepping out of your lodge room, walking a few paces, looking up, it is really, really bright, and it doesn't take more than a few seconds of dark adaption before you can start to see all of those dark lanes, all of that structure within the Milky Way. And as we've just seen, if you do astrophotography, then you start to pull out the color, which you can't see with your eyes, no matter how dark the sky is, your eyes will never see that color, but that's the genuine color of the Milky Way, which you can get when you've done a somewhat longer exposure. So again, this is a mosaic, as you can probably tell from the black corners. This particular mosaic was, I think, six panes uh, overlapping, again with a 35 millimeter lens. If we compare that with the picture I showed you a lot earlier in the talk, this is the picture I took on slide film, ISO 200. ISO 200, slide film. I um, can't remember exactly how long the exposure was, but you can clearly see the brighter stars, but you can see nothing of the Milky Way. And of course, what we've got here is exactly the opposite. You can see tons of information in the Milky Way, but the fainter stars have come out so brightly in the astrophotography that you now start to lose where the constellations are. They should be really bright, but the faint stars have now started to swamp. So there's Scorpius as seen on the slide film. And on the right-hand side, you might struggle to see it, so let me just outline it for you. There's Scorpius seen with the longer exposure wide-angle lens. And the difference is we can see the stars in both, but the amount of information, of course, the Milky Way is just completely, it's just not enough there on slide film. But with the digital film, we can see huge amounts of information. The same set of data, but now just four panes rather than the six panes. And again, we can see Jupiter and Saturn that Rob mentioned when we were looking at his image, which he claims is better, but you know that's wrong. So there's Jupiter and Saturn. Let me just point out the fact that, as Rob did say, this is only, of course, a small image because when you put four panes together, you've got millions of pixels in your image, which you can't possibly see. But let me just point out the fact that there are lots of star clusters and nebulae, globular clusters, open clusters, and nebulae. Here's just some of them. I've only highlighted the ones that happen to have Messier numbers. There's probably 10 times as many NGC numbers in there as well. So that's just some of the many clusters and nebulae that you can see in the images that you get by taking this sort of picture. Notice that the M numbers stop. That's not because there aren't any interesting nebulae and clusters down there in the bottom right-hand side. That's simply the limit of how far Charles Messier could see. From France, you can't see anything below that line. And so, of course, the Messier numbers are going to stop. But of course, there are all sorts of interesting objects beyond that particular line. When I looked at that image and when I thought about what I was doing, I thought, well, I've come on safari, I've got this 300 millimeter lens which I use for the animals. Here's a wide angle picture of the Milky Way, which is wonderful, but is it possible to think about, well, could you use a telephoto lens and look in more detail at what's going on? For instance, that particular pair there is the Lagoon Nebula and the Triffid Nebula. Why shouldn't I give it a go and put a 300 millimeter lens onto the camera and then put it on the tracker? I thought that might be pushing the tracker a little too far. But on the night I tried it, it was not fantastic in the sense that it was a little bit breezy. And with a camera that size, a little bit of a breeze meant the camera moved a little bit. 
but it was possible to pick up the M8 Lagoon Nebula and the M20 Triffid Nebula using a 300 millimeter lens on this same tracker that you're seeing at the front of the hall here. And as well as seeing the pink Lagoon Nebula and the two colors, the pink and the blue of the Triffid Nebula, again, digital photography, it means you don't have to take the entire image. If you wanted to blow up part of your image, you can see why the Triffid Nebula gets its name, because you can see the three lobes of the pink nebula. And again, you get the beautiful contrast between the pink and the blue of this particular nebula. So you can, with a tracker, do wide-angle photography, but you can do telephoto photography as well. So that, I guess, is the take-home message. If you're taking a holiday, whether it be in somewhere in the UK or somewhere in the world, where you have the opportunity to take pictures under dark skies, then I seriously suggest you think about packing a star tracker. It doesn't have to be anything too fancy. I'm not talking about a big equatorial mount. If you're going somewhere where you would be taking pictures anyway, then it only adds maybe a fraction of a kilogram or so to your luggage, but it does mean that you can take your camera with a wide-angle lens or a telephoto lens and get images like this. As long as you can get away from the light pollution, there's no reason why you don't get images like these. So that's the take-home message. Telescopes are great, but you can do so much with your own camera and a star tracker. So that, as they say, is the end or the ends. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>